Hello, welcome to this lesson on temperature and resistance. This is part two. I'm assuming you've seen and understood part one. In part two, we're going to take a look at semiconductors. Let's start by reminding ourselves what semiconductors are. Metals have a very low resistivity, they're good conductors. Insulators like glass and rubber have very high resistivities, they're good insulators. But some materials are somewhere in the middle, they're called semiconductors. There are a number of elements that are semiconductors, the well-known ones are silicon and germanium. Carbon is also a semiconductor. Compounds can be semiconductors as well. For example, gallium arsenide. One of the interesting things about semiconductors is you can control things like their resistivity and how resistivity changes with temperature by a process called doping. Now what doping means is adding small amounts of chemicals, elements. They're normally referred to as impurities, but it's a bad name. They are elements which are added in very small amounts to control the properties. And we're talking about one part per million, very small quantities. And a good example is silicon doped with phosphorus, trace amounts of phosphorus. We need to understand how a semiconductor works to understand the effect of temperature. This diagram is a simplified one showing some atoms of silicon. Now, it's in two dimensions. I'm not showing the nuclei or the internal electrons. What I am representing, the blue disks are the atom and the smaller yellow disks are the outer electrons, often called the valence electrons. And silicon has got four valence electrons in each atom. So remember this is only a representation of an atom. We're really interested in what happens to the valence electrons. So if we have some silicon, the atoms are arranged in a lattice, and at low temperatures, all of the valence electrons, the outer electrons, are bound to the atom. They, they are in orbit around the nucleus, like all the other electrons. That's not what happens in a metal. In a metal, valence electrons can escape and wander around. They are the conduction electrons, the valence electrons that have escaped. But in silicon at low temperature, all the valence electrons are bound. Now, it gets very interesting what happens if we increase the temperature. First thing, some of the valence electrons can escape if, they, if they're given enough energy due to the thermal motion. They can become conduction electrons. We've shown one on the diagram. The black space is where the electron was, and the electron is now outside the atom. It's available for electrical conduction. It can move around. It's left a space inside the atom, a missing, um, a missing electron. We're representing that with a black blob. Notice that makes the whole of that atom positive. It was neutral, but it's now missing the electron, so it's positive. And we call the space left behind a hole. And we have created equal numbers of conduction electrons and holes because for each conduction electron a, a hole is left behind and the hole is attached to a positive atom it's part of a positive atom probably should say ion you'll often see descriptions in books which use the concept of energy levels we can say that the valence electrons have energy in a certain range and that's called a valence band Conduction electrons of energy in a in a higher range that's called the conduction band, and because of quantum mechanics, we find that there's a range of energies electrons can never have. But when we create a conduction electron by knocking it out of an atom, we give the electron sufficient energy to get to the conduction band, and it leaves behind a hole in the valence band. That's one way of thinking about it. It's not a description I'm going to be using here. I just want you to be aware of it. Now, we've got our electron and the hole. 
Let's apply a voltage. Let's make the left side negative and the right side positive. It's not difficult to see what happens to the conduction electron, the one that's no longer bound. It's going to be pulled to the right. You could say repelled from the negative, attracted to the positive. So the conduction electron will drift to the right. Electrons drift negative to positive. Conduction electrons. But something else interesting happens. That hole is here. An electron from a neighbouring atom, uh, another valence electron, can drop into it. It can be pulled across by the electric field. That will mean the hole is no longer here. It's over on the left. This atom is no longer positive, it's neutral. And the atom on the left is positive. It's as if the hole has moved to the left. If you watch the diagram carefully, you'll see it jump now. Did you see? The hole is now there. I've shown the direction the hole has moved in red. And these holes behave like particles. They behave like positive particles and they move towards the negative side and away from the positive side. When the electron does the opposite. That's what happens when a voltage is applied. Interestingly enough, we know electrons can be scattered. We're showing that on the diagram here. We discussed that when we talked about metals. But holes can be scattered as well. The hole could have moved from the position I'm pointing to now to that position. The electron could have moved from the top left atom into the original hole. In that case, the hole would have jumped to the top left. So the holes can be scattered as well, and thermal motion can make this happen more. So the electrons and holes can be scattered as they move. Let's talk about doping briefly. Here's a, some silicon atoms. We're showing an electron, a conduction electron, and its hole on the right, formed as we've just described. But if we put a phosphorus atom in, a phosphorus atom has got five valence electrons. When it's surrounded by silicon atoms, it, it's energetically preferable for it. It's more comfortable for it to get rid of one of those electrons. And one of the electrons is released and it becomes a conduction electron, leaving the phosphorus atom with a positive charge because it's got one electron missing. So the, we say the phosphorus atoms donate conduction electrons, the electrons that they release. In this case, if you look and think about it, there will be more conduction electrons than holes. The phosphorus atom doesn't have a hole. It doesn't have something that will freely move about. Electrons aren't going to pop in and out of that phosphorus atom if we apply an electric field. So we've ended up with more conduction electrons and holes. More negative conduction electrons than positive holes. And we call this sort of material an N-type semiconductor. The N refers to negative. It means that the bulk of the charge carriers are negative. We say that the majority charge carriers are negative. The majority charge carriers are the electrons, not the holes. So they're negative. This is an N-type semiconductor. I could have doped the silicon with a different material. Here we've used boron, which has got three valence electrons. Again, you're going to have conduction electrons and holes from the silicon. But adding the boron makes something like this happen. The boron is more comfortable. It's energetically preferable for it, for it to have four valence electrons. So it's going to pick up an electron from a neighboring atom. And the boron atom is going to have an extra electron. It's a boron ion, technically. It's going to be negatively charged. But it, it's created a hole in the process. So we say boron atoms accept electrons. If we're in this situation, we're going to have more positive holes than we have negative conduction electrons. So the majority carrier, the type of charge carrier there is most of, the majority carriers are holes, they're positive. Therefore, we call this a P-type semiconductor. Now, let's get back. Get, get back to temperature. What happens if we increase the temperature? Well, there are two things to think about. First of all, 
more charge carriers, that's conduction electrons and holes, are produced. We've seen how that happens. And if there's more of them, it makes the material a better electrical conductor, which means the resistance decreases. That makes it, makes it an NTC, negative temperature coefficient material. If the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. It's NTC. On the other hand, we already know from what we discussed under metals that more collisions is a consequence of increasing the temperature, more scattering of the charge carriers, and that can be electrons and holes. So increasing the temperature could increase scattering, and that tends to make the resistance increase, which is what happens in a PTC, positive temperature coefficient material. So we've got both of these processes going on together in a semiconductor. Most Commonly, NTC dominates. This production of extra charge carriers is a much more significant process than the scattering. So most semiconductors are NTC, but they can be made PTC by using the right uh, semiconductor, the right doping, and the right concentration of doping, the right doping level. For an NTC semiconductor this would be a typical graph showing the resistance or resistivity as temperature changes it drops and it's non-linear it's a curve in electronics it's very useful to have components which change the resistance significantly when the temperature changes designed to give a large resistance change for a small temperature change these devices are called thermistors which is a combination of the word thermal and resistor thermistors they're made from semiconductors and that's a symbol they can be made PTC or NTC In a circuit, they might be used as part of a potential divider. If you're not familiar with potential dividers, you might want to watch the lesson on that. Here's a short example. We've got a 5 kilo ohm resistor, often referred to as a 5K resistor, in series with a thermistor. And we apply 9 volts across this potential divider. We're going to take, we're going to measure the voltage across the thermistor, that's our output voltage V out. We're told that resistance of the thermistor at 10K is 20 degrees C. Its resistance at 5, sorry, its resistance at 20 degrees C is 10K. Its resistance at 50 degrees C is 5K. And the question is, how big is V out at 20 degrees C and at 50 degrees C? If you want to pause the video and get a pen, or you don't need a pen and paper, you can do this in your head. If you want to pause the video and try that for yourself, as long as you know the potential divider formula from the potential divider lesson, you can do that very easily. Give the answer in a moment. Okay, let's go through that. Let's do 20 degree first. When it's 20 degrees, we've got 5K here and 10K here. V out will be a fraction of 9 volts. It'll be 9 times 10 over the total. That's 10 over 15. What's well, 9 times 2 thirds? It's 6 volts. At 50 degrees C, we've got 5K in series with another 5K. So the voltage across the thermistor is simply half. It's 5 tenths of 9. 9 times half, it's 4.5 volts. And that would be a typical circuit to use a thermistor. It might be operating an alarm for a temperature control, for example. OK, that's all we want to say about thermistors. Hope that was useful. The final part of temperature and resistance is about superconductivity.